Hello, 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 family. It is I, Ivan Bates. I will be your host today. Unfortunately, uh, the co-host will not be able to make it. So on this Monday, Manic Monday, as we're going to call it, we want to take as many calls from you, the listeners, so we can hear what's on your mind, what's going on, and what you're thinking. Whether you want to talk about the government shutdown, whether you want to talk about crazy Trump, whether you want to talk about the police commissioner, or whether you just want to talk about why are your neighbors in your parking spot when you didn't dang on shovel it yourself and you didn't put your chair out there. Whatever it is, call in because we definitely want to hear from you. Okay? <clears throat> so, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I had the opportunity like most of us, to be snowed in. If you have kids, small kids, sometimes you get snowed in with them. And when you're with your children, you're with your family, you have the opportunity to just either, one, want to pull your hair out, or two, sit down and just realize what a great blessing it is. For me, it's a great blessing. Whether you're sitting down and you're, you're at your house, you're at a friend's house, your family's house, you realize that you do have the opportunity to be around family, the ones you love. Unfortunately, in Washington, D.C., we had this government shutdown. I think this is, what, the 25th, 26th day of the government shutdown? I, I thought it was the 24th. The 24th day of the government shutdown. It's the largest government shutdown that we've ever had. A current number 45, Trump, has basically owned the government shutdown. But I don't think what he doesn't understand is that there are families and people who are out here hurting. People that needed their check on Friday they missed their first check. And now we're starting to feel and see the pain the government shut down. All this because they say they want a wall. He wants a wall. You know, the thing that's pretty, pretty shocking to me is when you sit and you talk and listen to people and they talk about this wall, what does this wall really mean? I mean, is it going to stop more people from coming across? Well, is it going to stop the guns? Is it going to stop the drugs? You know, I was wondering, if we spend $3 billion on this wall, what are we going to get for $3 billion? Because it's got to stop all the guns. It's got to stop all the drugs. And I think to really understand how successful this wall will be, we only need to look in the, no further than New York City and the El Chapo trial. On Friday, they had testimony, you know, Juan El Chapo Guzman. He's the drug kingpin of the Centelio cartel in uh, Mexico. They're really responsible for most of the drugs, especially the cocaine and heroin, now the marijuana and methamphetamines that's come to America. And they've shipped tons, probably millions of tons of drugs. And he's in trial in New York City. Um, I think it's supposed to be a six-month trial. I think they're in a month two. And um, there was testimony from some of the people that worked for him on how they shipped the drugs. And specifically what they said is they really didn't take it over the border per se, meaning where this wall will be built, but rather they were shipping drugs through the routes, whether it was the tractor trailers that have to go through um, the checkpoints. They're already on the roads. They already have the checkpoints, but they may send 30 or 40 tractor trailers loaded with the cocaine and they will sit down and maybe one or two will get stopped, but the rest of them get through. They would ship them by way of uh, train. They did this in the mid-90s. Uh, they also did a little bit, you know, the planes. But the newest way that they're really doing is they have these submarines where they kind of halfway submerge, where they're low enough that they can't be seen by the average boat, but they're not so deep that they are picked up by um, underwater uh, GPS to see where they are. And they're just riding right on to the beaches to some of the other places that they come, the subs are there, and they unload the drugs. We also know they have the tunnels. So if you have the tunnels, how on earth is this wall going to stop it? Those are some of the things that I think about on this Manic Monday. We sit down, we have those questions, and really what's going on with this wall and this government stop. I mean, before we go to the lines and start taking calls, um, I just wanted to make sure that we uh, 
give respect to our uh, sponsors this afternoon. Um, and uh, first of all, good evening, family. This is Brother Jason. I just want to let everyone know that the DMV Daily Show is being brought to you by our fine sponsors, such as the stellar legal team known as Bates and Garcia Law Firm, specializing in criminal defense, real estate, and bodily injury cases. Bates and Garcia is Maryland's legal dream team. They get those W's. In case you don't know what those W's means, that means they get those wins. Um, so if you sh uh, make sure you get in contact with them for your free consultation today, 410-814-4600. Again, the number to the Bates and Garcia law firm is 410-814-4600. Um, and if you uh, let them know that the DMV Daily Radio Show referred you, uh, they are going to make sure that you get the homeboy or homegirl hookup. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, again, the number is 410-481-4600, or you can visit them online at BatesGarcia.com. Um, this show is also being brought to you by uh, the uh, savvy political strategist at Politicom Strategic Solutions who have mastered the art of political communications and have successfully gotten people elected since the 1970s. Um, if you're looking to start a campaign um, or maybe want to inquire about starting a campaign, uh, this is the firm to give a call. Um, they will help you get set up with your campaign uh, with a user-friendly website, integrated social media, campaign plan, and more. Um, give them a call today at 240-242-7505. Um, now, uh, we just recently learned that there is a homeboy, homegirl discount. So if you let them know that DMV Daily uh, referred you, uh, they will make sure that you get a extremely affordable rate to get your campaign started. Um, again, the number is 240-242-7505 or visit them on the web at politicomsolutions.com. And uh, if you'd like to advertise your product and or service um, or business on the DMV Daily Radio Show and potentially reach thousands of customers around the globe, uh, give us a call today at 443-294-3900. Again, that number is two, I'm sorry, 443-294-3900. Uh, give us a call today and one of our sales representatives will make sure that they get in contact with you uh, and uh, help you find a uh, extremely affordable advertising package uh, on the DMV Daily uh, Radio Show and on our network as well. So, uh, Ivan, uh, I guess uh, I'll uh, kick this back to you, but first I'd like to give the phone number out. Uh, if you'd like to call us today on this Manic Monday, the phone number is 410-819-2370. Uh, again, the number is 410-819-2370. Uh, our lines are wide open. We have the capability of taking uh, unlimited calls. So uh, let's uh, let's hear from you today. 2370. 2370. All yep, right. 410-819-2370. All right. You know, I want to hear from the people. Look, I'm up here solo today. Um, didn't necessarily realize until a little while, a couple hours earlier I definitely would have had a guest, but a lot of things happen, um, and so I want to have you call in and be my co-host today, where I want to talk about the things that are on your mind so we can understand what's on the mind of people here in Baltimore City. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about this police commissioner, um, police commissioner designate Harrison. Um, I had the opportunity to read an article about him this past week from Kevin Rector. He went down to New Orleans and it was a very good article. Talked about his years of uh, service to the police and to the citizens of New Orleans, his early days of wearing a wire against some of the corrupt officers helping to take them down, um, being in drug and gang units, being in divisions and uh, units that went after some of the most vicious and violent uh, drug dealers and gang members in the city of New Orleans history having the opportunity to be in internal affairs, once again arresting corrupt officers and rising through the ranks to the point that he was still focused on the safety of the citizens and making sure he was there to help the police department be as positive and be a partner in the community. And they talked about the time period, I think he was there during Katrina. He had 22 members 
of the Eternal Affairs Department sleeping on his at his house just so he could try to keep them together. A number of officers just left the police department. So in some ways, when you sit down and look at Baltimore, you know, he has a background that talks about dealing with police corruption. He has a background in dealing with a police department that was in disarray. And, you know, the other thing I saw was that he's an ordained minister. And I believe him and his wife are high school sweethearts and they have two kids. So this appears at this moment in time to be the person at this moment in time that could really help Baltimore. I really want to get your opinions. I want you to call in and tell me your feelings. And once again, it's 410-819-2370. Call in at 410-819-2370. Jason, what are your feelings about that article? I didn't get a chance to to read uh, Kevin Rector's uh, article. I've uh, had a chance to look at uh, some of the um, interviews recently with the mayor and the squeegee boys um, and wanted to touch a little basis on that. Uh, The mayor recently announced uh, that she was going to add, I think, 20 additional officers uh, to the downtown area, um, including the Marine Patrol, uh, the Mounted Police, um, and also working with the downtown partnership, looking at uh, trying to curve some of the violence uh, that's been going on with the squeegee boys. I don't know if the family has heard, but uh, just uh, over the week, we had uh, someone that claimed that they were attacked uh, by the squeegee boys down on, I believe, Martin Luther King Boulevard mm-hmm. downtown. Um, and so uh, just recently, I was kind of looking at that. Um, and uh, she was on the um, 105.7 uh, radio show, and uh, they were really kind of hitting her hard uh, in reference to the squeegee boys and uh, a lot of citizens feeling that it's unsafe to visit downtown. Um, and uh, many of the guys that were on the fan uh, were saying that many of their friends refused to patronize uh, downtown. You know, I don't want us to get in that position to where we stop patronizing downtown um, and hope that we can, you know, find a way to bring safety back and security back uh, because there's a lot of restaurants down there that employ a lot of folks throughout the city down there. Um, And if the restaurants are not doing well, if the establishments down there are not doing well and are at least seeing some sort of general business, they're going to shut their doors, uh, which means, you know, hundreds of jobs uh, uh, being eliminated in the process. So, Um, You know, I definitely encourage everyone to patronize the businesses of the downtown corridor. Um, But um, we definitely have to get a grip and figure out what we can do uh, for these young men and in some cases, young ladies uh, that are out there with the squeegee crew. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You know, it's a lot going on. People, uh, when you look at what's the squeegee kids, um, you know, they're not out there robbing. They're doing, they're out there working. One of the questions I have, you know, especially out there, it's cold. You know, where can we try to give them a job? Because it's obvious that they want to do something. And for them, that's what they want to do. It's obvious that they have a spirit of entrepreneurship. And um, having that spirit of entrepreneurship is one of those things in which uh, these kids can really do something. We just have to give them the opportunity. We have to sit down and provide that positive structure for them. You know, one of the things I remember is when we used to have the uh, PAL centers. We don't have the PAL centers. So where are these kids supposed to go? What are these kids supposed to do? You know, when you sit down and you look and think about it, the government is shut down because they want to build a wall. They want to build a wall with billions of dollars. Only thing these kids are asking for here in Baltimore is a chance. The opportunity to be able to, to, to go to a place to be safe. Maybe they want to play on a computer workstation. Just the opportunity to make a couple dollars and put it in their pocket so they can go out and purchase something legally that they really want. How can we bring those two things together? How can we give these kids the opportunity to have that by making sure we can continue to keep the citizens safe and protected? There's got to be a way that we can go ahead and do this. Um, and I just think that this is something that this, the city's going to spend money on all these extra police officers. 
look, we have 300 plus murders four years in a row. We need to spend our money trying to make sure we solve those murders. We need to spend the money making sure we do it the right way. Right now, having police stand over to the quote unquote squeegee kids is nothing more than window dressing. Let's find jobs for these kids so we can deal with the situation and really make put the kids in a positive light and that will also allow the citizens to feel safer as well. What do you say out there, family? You want to call in and talk about it? And we see some folks online uh, talking about uh, the squeegee boys. And actually, uh, thank you, Leslie Carter, for sharing the uh, interview that the mayor did on the fan radio um, on uh, 105.7. Um, interesting, again, because it, I, I always think when I hear them guys uh, talk to the mayor, first of all, I think they're, they're disrespectful in a lot of cases. Um, he called her Miss Mayor. Um, as opposed to Madam Mayor or uh, addressing her as uh, the mayor, um, uh, one of the hosts on there. And I just felt that they were, a lot of times they're kind of belittling towards her um, and, uh, you know, seem to be on an attack uh, mode when it comes to uh, policing uh, in this city. Um, but uh, thank you for sharing that uh, feed, that uh, podcast feed, uh, Leslie. Um. Now, oh, let's sit down and talk about what's been going on. Um, but uh, last week we had a couple of really, really interesting good shows. You know, we have uh, this week, I think tomorrow we're going to have uh, a number of potential candidates if I'm not mistaken, Jason, for the Democratic Central Committee. They'll have the opportunity to have a little debate here. Um, many of you know the Democratic Central Committee is the group of uh, individuals selected and elected by many by the citizens in the Democratic Party. And they sit down when they elect an individual. These are the people who their job is to support the Democratic Party here in Baltimore City. And the president, Ben Smith, actually was selected by the other members, and then he ended up leaving, um, taking another job with uh, Dr. Maya, uh, Dr. Maya Rockamore Cummings with the state party. So I think we'll have at least three of the four individuals running for the presidency. Tomorrow we'll sit down and have a live debate. But right now, um, I think we have a caller on the line. Yeah, I'm not sure which of the three will uh, be here tomorrow, but you have, um, what is it, uh, Caritha, Barbara, yes. uh -huh. uh, Alex Garcia, Monica Cooper, and Jasmine Collins are all running uh, for the position, correct? Yep. Okay. And I think we'll have at least three of them here in studio tomorrow, family. So uh, make sure you join us tomorrow. We have... Uh, Brother Christopher Irving on the line. Uh, Brother Christopher, are you there, sir? Hello? Hello? Hey, Hello. hey. Brother Chris, how are you? All right. Oh, am I on now? Yep. Yes, sir. You're on now. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Um, I was calling about the, the, the issue um, with the squeegee kids. And, you know, I, of course, I agree with everything that you laid out. Um, being in the the educational aspect of reentry, um, I want to highlight one aspect of it, and I heard it mentioned on a previous show, in that we don't sometimes consider the aptitude of the people that we're dealing with, where they are, um, in their in their ability to learn. So many of them are, are homeless. Some are addicted. Some have other, so, you know, the social ills of, of any society much less this one in particular here in Baltimore. So the social services aspect, um, the treatment aspect of dealing with them needs to be far more pronounced. We really need to create a very, um, a very, very specific approach to, to, to dealing with some of the social issues of our society. Now, so, yes, we know all of the departments and agencies are already there. But how do we, how do we, we have to find a way to meet them where they are because you can't just force people to go get the help that they need. And we see the issues manifest on the streets, but it's almost like 
we just want to throw police at everything. And a lot of things the police just are not equipped to deal with. No, I agree. You know, I was reading an article this weekend that talked about, I think it was an op-ed written by Kimberly Fox, who's the prosecutor up in Chicago. Chicago, And she yeah. was talking about an op-ed piece, and it, she'd written with someone else who, who I forget the gentleman's uh, name, but um, they do a lot of work with the youth up in Chicago. And they were talking about, we tend to rely and look only at the police in helping to solve the problems and the ills that society has. We blame the police for everything. I think you're mm -hmm. right. You know, um, a few weeks ago, I think we had Councilman Zeke Cohen. He talked about his uh, bill that was um, our program with City Hall that was basically hiring children for jobs. And one right. of the things I think they wanted to do was make that full time. And I think that's something we as a citizens really need to sit down and think about. Because if we're not investing the money in a Powell Center and a rec center, then where is this money going? And what do you expect these kids to do? They're going to sit at home and play video games all day. They're going to come out. When they come out, what are they going to do? And the kids, eventually, when you talk to them, they want, they want items. They want to work. Yeah. They have that energy. What are we going to do with it? That's why I think it's so important so important that when we sit down and look at the plans by our elected officials, what are they specifically saying they're going to do and how do they specifically say they can target juveniles to make a change? Well, there's, there's one other thing I want to offer. There, there was a period um, where I was working a, a overnight position and um and it had i had the occasion to come into contact with a lot of the kids on the streets who were homeless um and then subsequently there was a program offered um at the liberty rec center where they were able to participate if they wanted to and they were given a stipend and so they, so there was a monetary value attached to simply showing up but it was showing up in the capacity that would ultimately help them and this is where you got to see, it's kind of what we talk about. It wasn't quote unquote a job, but like I said, it was a stipend. Um, so there was an economic driver behind showing up. And you got to, you got to really see that, um, even where it would benefit them as much as it actually helped them, there was still something of a disconnect that just needed to be addressed with social services. So I, I I think, and, and obviously it's easier to talk about things than it is to actually do them, and especially when you're attaching the doing to a bureaucracy. But I, but I think it's something that, that is worth, um, you know, really focusing the attention on it and giving the time to, because the upside would be so great. I mean, just imagine if, yeah. if, if we were able to impact, um, you know, a portion of that population of people to show that it worked, but the work that will go into it, you know, it's going to be a lot of grunt work and a lot of, not a lot of notoriety, not a lot of photo taking because it's, there's a grind aspect to it. But I just think it's, it's so worth it. I, I just hope that um, it's given the attention that, that it, that it calls for. Brother Christopher, and this is something that, you know, that I know you follow me on Facebook that I've been ranting and raving about for the last couple of days. Um, out in Richmond County in uh, California, uh, they actually mm -hmm. uh, had a stipend program. They were giving the children uh, $1,000, the ones that they considered to be the most violent uh, and the ones that were actually doing the shootings. And at one time, Richmond County, out of, out of all the counties in California, uh, had some of the highest numbers as far as uh, shootings were concerned. Um, and they would give them a thousand dollar stipend every month um, and require them to come in and get everything from GED, substance abuse, uh, job readiness and soft skills. Um, and they were able to really curve a lot of the violence. Uh, I think the first year they cut it almost in half um, or, or, or close to 60 percent the first year. Um, and we know in Baltimore City, I think there's something like they're estimating anywhere a few hundred of these young troubled men and, and ladies that really need to be addressed. Um, and I know that mm -hmm. organizations like Ro ROCA currently are trying to address some of these young men and ladies, but you know, we might need to look at just a small carrot on the stick. I mean, if we're spending you know, 200 some odd million dollars a year in incarceration just for residents out of Baltimore City, and we're spending almost a third of our budget in public safety, 
you know, as far as uh, the police and the judicial system in Baltimore City, if we just take a fraction of that, a few million dollars, and look at a stipend program and make sure that, you know, we can help some of these young men and ladies to keep off the streets and to, you know, to uh, try to uh, curve some of the violence that's going on in the street. I think that we may see a difference uh, in the streets if we go ahead and we uh, provide like a stipend program. I mean, don't you agree? No, oh, absolutely. And let, let me first say this, and not, not in response, I agree with everything that you just said. But let, let me also say that in conversation, separate and apart from what you just said, in conversation, I think many of us, we address it as if there's some one um, one shot fits all kind of answer to this. When obviously there's a multiple, there, there, there are multiple lanes that need to be approached simultaneously. So while there there needs to be exactly what you just laid out, I think we need to be more intentional about uh, while we just just as in, in, emphasizing, emphatic, just as emphatic, I had to reach for a minute, just as emphatic <laughs> as we are about STEAM and STEM, we should also be that equally as emphatic um, about getting kids into some type of apprentice programs for the blue-collar trades. Um, we want all of our children to be doctors and lawyers, which is great, and, and mathematicians, but some of them will want to work with their hands, and so welding is still an awesome profession. Um, all of those kinds of things, all of the professions that made Bethlehem Steel what it was, realized that it wasn't about the company, it was about the people who made up the trades that the company needed. And those people are still here in this city. So there are a lot of things that we can be doing simultaneously as opposed to, you know, just this one thing. And a lot of people have said this over a long stretch of time that we need to bring back the trades and, and all these different things. But but if you if you couple... Um, those, the, again, the STEM and STEAM with trades, and then with a with a with an actual full throated so, social services approach, um, as well as some of the criminal justice reform. When you put all of this together, it makes up an awesome stew that um, that that Baltimore needs to taste right about now. This will mm -hmm. never be turned around on the back of, of of the police department, much less a single individual being a commissioner. And I, I, I'm I'm quite sure that that person, whoever they will be will be the first to admit that. So we need to be more um, comprehensive in our approaches and, and, and bearing the weight on more shoulders than we're looking for. Yes, sir. Well, uh, Brother Christopher, we uh, always appreciate uh, your knowledge and your wisdom here on the DMV Daily Radio Program. And again, uh, keep up the good work and let folks how, know how they can get in contact with you because, again, you do great work and how they can help your organization. Uh, I, I thank you for that. And let, let me, before I even go into our own, our own stuff, what you what you all are doing there is is unbelievably um, important. And I love this show. It, it's what has been needed um, political discussion in Baltimore, where where it gets lively. Um, it needs to be unfettered and, and, and realistic um, and intelligent. And that's what you guys bring to the air. Uh, so shouts yeah. out to to you all, Ivan, um, in front you. of the camera, and Jason, you behind it and Hassan, wherever he is today, and, and Mark McLaurin as well. Um, my, my organization is the Lazarus Right. Um, it, is, it is intentionally named what it is, and that in that, when people have paid the price, if they've paid the penance for whatever they've been um, deemed to have transgressed, then they should be able to come back to life. Um, they yes. should be able to move forward with their lives and support their families and their community um, by extension. And so our number is 410 Eight four four nine three zero zero four one zero eight four four nine three zero zero, and we do uh, free CDL training uh, because it's free. We start out with the Class B license, so people can drive dump trucks, buses, school buses, mm -hmm. things of that nature. Um, and we are expanding into tractor trailer training as well. But mm -hmm. again, thank you for the time, and you guys have a great day. Continue to show. I'll be listening. Thank you, thank you, my yeah, brother. Thank Have you, a brother. good evening, Chris. Yeah, thank you for all, all right. that you do. Again, and uh, family, you can call in 410-819-2370. Uh, again, the number is 410-819-2370. We do have another caller. Uh, we have uh, Sister Joy uh, on the line. Sister Joy, are you there? Whatever they've been um, deemed to have transgressed, then Sister they should Joy? be able to come Joy? back to life. 
Um, they yeah. should be able to move forward with their lives and support their families Maybe. and their community um, by extension. And so our number is 41. Sister Joy, you there? Hello. Hello, Sister Joy. Yes. Hi. How are you? Hey. How are you? Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. Good, good evening. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on what they talked about earlier with the blue collar trade. I wanted to ask Mr. Bates first um, a two part question. First, what attracted you to a career in law and secondly how can we attract more young people to law enforcement because with all the problems keeping um, a commissioner having someone at the top how do we get people engaged and interested in being a part of the law community oh um so, wow that's that's a uh, an interesting question it's a good question <laughs> you put them on the spot yeah you did you did <laughs> now reference to the law <laughs> how i got interested involved in the law um really by chance you know when i uh, my father was in the military and um we moved around a bit and eventually we moved down south in hampton virginia i didn't never ever in my life saw a black lawyer black attorney Never met a black lawyer until I went to college, went to Howard University. And um, a young lady I was dating at the time, her father was a judge. And I met him. And it was the first time I ever met a black judge. And her mother was a lawyer um, and was the vice president of a company called LexisNexis. And just sitting down, talking to her parents, um, they were the people that really opened up my mind in terms of what law was, the opportunity, um, gave me an opportunity to really understand Thurgood Marshall, all the, the trailblazers, um, Charles Hamilton, Houston, individuals that had really blazed the path in terms of law. Um, I knew that I wanted to do something. I knew I wanted to help people. But it was having a role model who looked like me was the person who I wanted to one day become. And he's the individual who really opened up my mind to being a lawyer. Um, now, how do we get kids and the children involved in law enforcement? I think it's, it's role models. These, the children need to see someone who looks like them in the leadership position that they can identify with. I think when you have all of these kids here in the city, it's not just looking like them, but it's a person who they can identify with, a person who may and who has to be able to speak their language, a person who can sit down and talk about, hey, I had a struggle here. I did, didn't do this right, didn't do that right. And a person who the children, the kids actually connect with and believe in. I think when you have that with a role model and they see that role models out there trying to make their life better, then they will at least they may not want to become police officers right away, but then they have respect for the position and having respect for the position eventually says, you know what, maybe this is something that I could do. Because when you change the narrative in terms of the way people think about the Baltimore City Police Department, then you have a different opportunity to say, you know what, maybe that's something I, I could do. I'm pretty sure and I'm, on, I'm certain that it can happen because there are a lot of people when I talk to them, they're like, oh, you know what, I just want to be a CO. My aunt's a CO. My cousin's a CO. That's something that I want to do. Well, you know, how did they even know about a correctional officer other than a family member, someone they knew, someone they looked up to? So I think a lot of it has to be the positive role models and, ex and just making sure so that the jobs and those careers are accessible and attainable to them. Thank you. I, th I think that's a really good perspective because it's hard to attract more people to be in the ranks when you see it's so much shuffling going on at the top. Yes. No, I, I agree. I think, you know, you have to have a level of stability within the system. Um, look, when you sit down and I, I'm really excited about Commissioner Designate Harrison because he has had the stability. He's been in that one organization for a while. And um, I was pleasantly surprised to see that he, he was an ordained uh, a minister as well. And that tells me that you it's not just not being the top, it's about being the community. Um, when you're in a community, people see you. People see you in a different light. People see that you're willing to come 
leave your quote unquote ivory tower office and come down into the community and that's not how it should be they should be able to sit and see and touch and know that you're no different than they are that you breathe the same oxygen and that you bleed just like they do and that you know it's an honor and you're humbled to lead them and to be that type of fi public figure for them and then i really believe that you'll see a different mindset with the children and the kids they just need to know that you're there and you care and you love them and that you're there to support them. Uh, Ivan, do you know if there's any programs through the Monumental Bar Association or uh, any of the lawyer organizations out there that actually look at trying to outreach to some of these young men and ladies and bring them in and maybe, you know, inspire them to be paralegals and to get into the uh, law field? Yeah, a lot of the programs, when I used to be president of Monumental Bar, we participated in a program. We've adopted schools. We adopted Douglas High School, and they have a, a law program. So we went over there. We presented to the kids. We spent time with the kids. Um, we worked with some of the people over there at Douglas High School. So you do see Monumental Bar out there. It's something that they the kids can see one-on-one. -on -one. It's interesting. You know, being a defense attorney, you come across quite a few children. And sometimes the kids don't feel that they could be lawyers. And then sometimes I sit and talk to them. I said, man, let's sit down. Let's buckle down. Let's get you through this situation. And then you definitely have the aptitude. You have the ability to go get your high school diploma. Let's get you in college. And then we can get you to law school. And it's just having someone who has that position believe in them. And once, they, you, once I see when they feel that someone in that position believes in them, that's when you almost give them a new, new lease on life. Because for me, it was having my, the young lady, having her father believe in me and telling me, you know what, you should go to law school. And when he told me that, I'd never considered that until he told me. You know, I was in college and really didn't know what I wanted to do until I met him uh, my sophomore year. And then when he told me that, that's when I knew that's what I wanted to become, a lawyer. Sister Joy, you have anything else for us? Um, just one more question. Um, with um, you, Mr. Bates, saying people should be in the community, have you worked with any programs um, to get students in the courtroom or with mock trials or things like that? Well, I have. I have um, done a lot. There's a judge named Wanda Hurd. She's a judge down in circuit court. And it's funny, this, uh, <laughs> she does a program. It's called The Three Pigs. And it's important because she brings kids from the school system here in Baltimore City and she introduces them to the court system. And the way she does that is she tells a story of three pigs. Look, we all know the nursery rhyme. And um, she has the uh, baby pig as, quote unquote, defendant and they're charged. And there's an individual that's a prosecutor, and there's an individual that's a judge. And so the same evidence they talked about, the first pig that blow down the house and all that happened. Um, and so you have all of that going on. And at the end, it's very funny because the little, you know, the, the first pig and blow, huff and puff blow down your house. And so what she does, she puts her own little spin on it. Her first, the first pig um, has a house that's made of uh, basically wood. And the pig blows down and the big bad wolf blows down that house. The second house has is made of steel. And then the wolf comes and blows down that house. So you have the first two pigs to then go to the baby pig's house. And the baby pig has a house made of brick and mortar. And the house won't blow down. But then they put a pot of hot boiling water. So when the pig comes down the attic, the, I mean, when the wolf comes down the attic, the wolf then falls into the pot. And um, what happens, is, are you responsible? Are you not responsible to what happened to the wolf? And so what it does, it takes a nursery rhyme that everybody knows. It updates it to a modern flair, but it gives it a spin in terms of the criminal justice system. The children sit there, the juries, the children are the prosecutors. They the have children like a mock are the trial. Defense attorneys. Right, yes, right, right. the children are the judges. Um, they're usually one or two judges. And the jury goes in there and they have to, you know, decide on the, art, the evidence. You know, I was a, uh, I helped the prosecution um, this past uh, fall. I helped with this program with Judge Hurd. 
and we were on the prosecution side. And I had to help the young, and there were three prosecutors, I helped them put together an argument. Um, they did put the witnesses on. Everything that a lawyer would do in the courtroom so that we could expose this to them so that we could give them the opportunity to say, hey, you too can be a, an attorney. I feel that those types of programs are what are needed. There's so many people that are doing those types of programs in our community um, that, you know, from my standpoint, when Judge Hurd gave me a call that has asked me a second or third time I've been involved with this, I'm always excited to be a part of that because I want to see our children learn about the criminal justice system as children and not learn about the criminal justice system as adults. That's my hope and that's my goal. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for being so active and um, involved in children's lives in the community because we need to see more of that. So thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you very much for calling, Joy. And, and don't be a stranger, Joy. Make sure you call in in the future, all right? I will. Thank you. All right. thank, Have thank a good you. night. All right. Wow, all right. that was an amazing call. Um, yeah, yeah, it was. And, and actually uh, brings up, uh, uh, we probably should look at bringing in, uh, and I keep messing this up because it's Judge Heard, but it's she's a certain type of judge. And I always... No, she's a circuit court. She's a... Let me give you a little bit of a background about Judge Wanda. But but there's a certain way that you should address her because the honorable. You want to say the honorable, right? Well, I thought she had a. She's the chief judge, right? That's right. She's the chief judge. judge. So yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. Right. right. (laughs) So you know, this is something that's very important for um, our our listeners, but also specifically for females, because Judge Heard knocked down the door to become the first female chief judge for the circuit court of Baltimore City. Yes. First African-American woman to hold that position. And to have a judge that's been there, she's been on the bench, she cares about the children. You know, Judge Hurd is one of those judges who I first saw give people, give children, and give these individuals who are charged with crimes, not look through them, but understand who they were. She'd give you an opportunity. She'd give you the chance to get a job. Now, if you messed up, you committed crimes continuously, then she would go ahead and hold you accountable. But she would give you that opportunity. She'd give you the opportunity to get a job. And then she would sometimes call the programs herself from the bench to try to place you in a program, whether you needed drug treatment or whatever you were looking for to help turn your life around. And so when I sit down and look at a judge, she's one that does that. Judge Geller, Seth Geller is another judge that does that. There are a number of judges on the circuit court for Baltimore City that are really trying to be what I call judicial activists to make sure that they can give the services needed. But they also, also will hold you accountable if you sit down and uh, mess up. Yeah, we we need to really look at uh, possibly bringing in uh, Chief Judge Hurd uh, on the program, and uh, we've spoken to her in the past. And again, she's she has such great programs, and uh, she actually works with uh, Brother Leo Burroughs uh, Jr. Uh, with the Roots of Scouting. She actually sits on one of the committees, yes. um, and again, she's very active in in the community. Um, I mean, something that I wanted to just uh, bring out some information really quick in reference to the government uh, shutdown. There are so many companies out there uh, that are assisting and helping uh, with those impacted. Uh, We know that here in Maryland, um, we literally have uh, hundreds of thousands of workers here uh, that are being affected by the government shutdown. But uh, everything from Verizon uh, deferring their payments for their customers, both in the wireless side as well as on the uh, FiOS uh, home service side. Uh, we know that T-Mobile as well is looking at deferring uh, payments and helping those, assisting those with their payments as far as their bills. And AT&T jumped in as well. Um, Laundry City in in Baltimore uh, is offering free laundry washes to any uh, federal worker that's impacted at both of their locations, which I thought that was phenomenal. Um, And the state worked really hard to make sure that uh, anyone affected that were in the SNAP program, in the food stamp program, uh, received their benefits early uh, so that they wouldn't be greatly impacted. Um, And uh, according to an article I was reading, uh, more than 6,500 Marylanders receive 
uh, up to $75 million worth of food stamps mm. uh, or food supplements uh, in uh, Baltimore City. Um, and I know that the food banks are, are truly are, are trying to do the best that they can. Um, and I would encourage the community to look at uh, donating uh, to your local yes. food bank because right now a, a lot of our federal workers are uh, relying on uh, and are um, referred to the food bank to get assistance and uh, they are truly being uh, tested uh, during this federal shutdown. So uh, if you can uh, find a local food bank within your area um, and just maybe buy a bag or two of some groceries um, and try to see if you can just uh, do your part. If your family is fine and your family is not being affected by this federal shutdown, uh, at least see if you could help in some way uh, our federal workers by donating to a local food bank. So, yeah, that's true. You know, so often we always seem to want to criticize our government, um, government workers. I'm a big believer when someone does something positive, we have to acknowledge them. I see up here, I want to read from Sh Shane Bryan. Major props to DOT for keeping it going through the snow this weekend. That is a good sign for the winter weather ahead. You know, Shane and everybody else, Leslie Carter also says the same thing. Shane, yes, huge shout out to DOT. You know, what that says is that, look, it's a part of the government that's working for the people. Yeah. And I think it's important what you have is the people who are here. Both Shane and Leslie Carter are big community activists who do a lot in their community um, and really care about the people in their community and the city. And for them to sit down and recognize uh, DOT is, is, isn't huge, but it's just who they are. But, you know, we want to sit down and say something positive because so often we always want to sit and criticize everybody. My street's not plowed. Sit, yeah, <laughs> but we also, when they're doing a good job, they're doing a good job. Yeah. yeah. There was an article recently in the Baltimore Sun that talked about five things to watch this week in the Maryland General Assembly. And number one, it talked about, is this the session of the minimum wage increase? We know that's something really big that Marx is really about. He's trying to fight. We know a few years ago, Catherine Pugh was in office, ran and said she would go ahead and approve the $15 an hour wage in, minimum wage increase in Baltimore City. It passed through the city council and then she vetoed it. And now it's in the legislature. Is this the year? Is this the time that it will pass? I want to hear from you callers, your feelings, yay or nay. And what do you think? Some people sit down and say, hey, $15. You know, that's going to hurt business. They're not going to want to sit down and make the payments. And, you know, they're not going to hire that many workers. They're going to, you know, have fewer workers. But I also hear the other side, the other argument that says, hey, $15 an hour, hey, that's not quite a living wage, but it gets us a lot closer. When people are paid $15 an hour, they're going to take their money, they're going to spend the money, in the, and the economy will continue to almost have an effect where more people making more money will be more constant, consistent business. You know, there are some things that really, you know, be, need to be looked at. You know, this is a bill that delegate. Corey McCray is sponsored in the Senate version of the bill, while Prince George's County Democrat Diane Fennell will sponsor the House legislation. And in that, the bill will raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour by 2023, a move that advocates say would benefit nearly a quarter of the state's workforce. Miller has pledged that a wage increase will pass this year in some form, but he hasn't provided more details about what shape he wants to see the legislation take form and shape you know it's interesting i think i saw where governor hogan really didn't seem to be a big proponent of that um but we, it's something we really need to look at look i'm a small businessman and so this is something that is near and dear to my heart you know i remember many many a day working for seven dollars and fifty cent an hour and really think i was doing something um but i also as a business owner, I recognize that $15 an hour is really not $15 an hour. That's really about seventeen fifty an hour when you have payroll tax. And so I see it from both sides, but I definitely feel that we're at a point where, I mean, what do you want to have? Every single nickel dime or in the profit that we really have to, uh, um, we really have to sit down and look at this 
and understand that if we want to make a change in our society, that everybody must be involved, that everybody needs to sit down and, and businesses, give up some of your profits for $15 an hour. Give that opportunity to have individuals make a real living wage. If you can have the $15 an hour, and that's where we are right now, and we can sit down and look at it. I mean, you know, Seattle passed this law a few years ago. It's $15. It might even be $20 an hour. But business hasn't suffered. Their economy has grown. And it continues. About Seattle, Seattle. And, and San Francisco as well. Yes. And I'll talk about that in yep. a second. Uh, both of them both have $15 an hour now. And, you know, I feel that. You know, this is something that's important. And this isn't just important to Baltimore City, but this is important to everybody in the city. One of the problems that when I look at Baltimore City, we have to find a way to level the playing field. $15 an hour won't level it, but $15 hour, dollars an hour allows people at least to have a little bit of a springboard to try to make it to that next level. And it's a small part to pay. And as a small business owner, I do my very best to make sure that I can do what I can to pay people that sort of a wage. Um, I do recognize sometime it is hard, but as a small business owner, once you have that opportunity to one, have a business and to have people from Baltimore City or other jurisdictions support your business, then you have to give back. And if $15 an hour is all that you have to do to give back, then I don't really think that that's too much to ask. What about you, Jason? How do you feel about this? So I understood the mayor's point at the time when the, the, the hearings was uh, being held down in City Hall. And I actually was the operational manager for uh, a chain of Metro PCSs at the time. Um, and we were one of the uh, particular companies that would have been affected by the increase. And I understood where the mayor stood at when she was saying that she didn't want to create a donut hole. Um, we do have some companies, well, we have a lot of companies statewide that don't even pay close to $15 an hour. Um, yeah. and, and these workers are doing some amazing work within the community. Like for instance, the nurses uh, at the um, uh, John Hopkins. Uh, we saw that just recently uh, at the Baltimore City delegation of the uh, General Assembly um, when they met up uh, over at um, Morgan State they talked about this. A, a lot of the workers got up and said that they didn't make $15 an hour, that mm -hmm. they are making $12 and $13 an hour. Um, and a lot of them were struggling uh, just to be able to pay their bills. And if they did want to go to school and, and try to pursue, you know, a degree in something else or try to go more deeper into the medical field that uh, they were uh, financially burdened uh, because they weren't even making a livable wage. Um, I, I think it was though a little bit arrogant of her to sit there and say that she didn't promise this on a Bible, that she didn't put her hand on the Bible and promise the $15. Um, I think that she shouldn't have made necessarily that statement um, because it just showed a little bit of arrogance. Uh, but I understand her point that we didn't want to create this donut hole where we have, you know, Baltimore City's $15 an hour and then the surrounding counties are at a different wage level. And then we end up losing companies like, for instance, like Cloverland Milk and some of these other trucking companies and other uh, particular industries that may be in Baltimore City that decide to go out in the county because it's cheaper to operate in the county. So I understood that. And from a small business aspect, uh, our business, for instance, which, which tends to be a cash based business, um, the requirement was was that if you made over, I believe the cap was something like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for your business and had. Uh, if you had less than 15 employees, uh, you wouldn't be um, you, you would be exempt um, and actually would over time uh, slowly but surely could raise up to the $15 minimum wage um, for us uh, because we were a cash business that received payments for cell phone bills. Uh, we did easily close to $750,000 in sales. But out of the mm -hmm. majority of that money that came in, most of that money went to T-Mobile, went to the actual franchise. Mm -hmm. And we got only a $3 service payment out of that money that we collected. So for us, okay. we wouldn't have been exempt, even though we were under 15 employees. We met that, that standard, yeah. and that would allow us to, over time, to have to kind of uh, you know, uh, rev up to the $15 an hour wage. 
we didn't meet the exemption as far as the amount of sales was concerned. And that was our argument was that we wanted to raise the sales cap a little bit higher because a business like us that deals with a lot of cash um, and only gets a little bit out of that service payment that comes in, we wouldn't have been exempt. And we just really couldn't afford at the time unless T-Mobile, uh, the parent company, decided to pay us a little bit more or raise the fee that was collected from its customers. We wouldn't have really been able to afford uh, that that type of salary and still allow a commission because we were also an hourly wage plus a commission. So we would have to go to either hourly and cut out commission or we would you know, ask for a little bit of grace from the city uh, to make sure that we didn't have to meet that, that, that quota right away um, by raising how much money uh, a business took in uh, in order to be exempt and, and again, be able to kind of move into it gracefully. Um, and so uh, that was on our only argument. Um, and, and again, hopefully uh, this time around, because we're looking at it more in a state initiative, so we're not looking at it um, more in a local juris jurisdiction. We're looking at it statewide. Um, and I believe there was one particular uh, delegate, and if the family has an opportunity to go online to dmvdaily.news, uh, Hassan's uh, Annapolis report is out, the second uh, episode of the Annapolis report is out. And he actually spoke to a delegate uh, during the uh, opening day of Annapolis, uh, the Maryland General Assembly uh, opening day. Um, and one of the delegates that he spoke to, I'm trying to find out now from him who that was, um, was actually saying that for him, $15 an hour wasn't enough. That actually, technically, for him, that's not even a livable wage anymore. And that he was actually looking at a higher standard of like $23 an hour uh, possibly going to um, which would be more of a livable wage. Um, and, you know, of course, with the, uh, uh, what, what they call the index um, uh, uh, that, that comes out every year. Um, what? Uh, the, the index that determines the cost of living. Oh, cost the of cost living. cost of living, okay. right. So he yeah. was saying that based on the cost of living estimates, that really and truly we should be more closer to $23 an hour. Um, speaking on this $15 an hour, again, you, you were right, Ivan, you have San Francisco, uh, Seattle are some of the two states that are already implementing $15 an hour. New York City is in the process of slowly getting there as well. They introduced a bill uh, in their city council uh, that uh, has $15 an hour, um, uh, I believe, I think 2024, something like that, 2025, somewhere around there, they should be close to $15 an hour. Um, the only thing that they really could find in some of these states doing surveys, and uh, they had a university study, uh, Seattle, Washington's $15 an hour minimum wage. The only thing that they could really find was was that those workers that had no skills, mm -hmm. it was harder for them to find jobs than it was those that already had a skill set, already had uh, an extent of work history. So what ends up happening is with the higher wages, most employers are not willing to take the risk at low skilled level employees mm -hmm. um, and in some cases weren't willing to train employees and were more willing to take in someone that was a little bit more seasoned and has a little bit more work experience. So that's the only real residual uh, that they were having that and they were also having some issues with some of the employers were uh, kicking away from 40, 40, uh, 40 hour a week uh, work weeks. Um, and in Seattle, uh, they're introducing a bill now to try to make it so that if an employee kind of backlashes at their employees and cuts back, you know, the 40 hour work week um, and, and because of the uh, $15 an hour minimum uh, wage, that that worker can actually file a complaint against the uh, uh, employment office or uh, whoever oversees EEOC or uh, one of the organizations statewide uh, that oversees the wage and labor enforcement and that you can actually file a complaint against that employer uh, because that employer should not really be cutting back on wages uh, hour, hourly. Um, and that was really the only other residual effect was that uh, some employees were cutting back to 30 hour work weeks um, you know, as a result of the $15 uh, minimum wage increase. So, but uh, it's been a win-win for both uh, Seattle and both um, San Francisco so far. So, I mean, I think Baltimore could be in the same place. I think it could be a win-win. I think the entire state it would be a win-win. Um, we're at a unique time period in our country. 
where I think citizens and people need to know that their government does care for them and sees them as people. I think, you know, this is a small step, but it's a needed step. And I think that, look, like I said, I'm a business owner. I pay payroll tax. I pay, you know, you know, the fees to people and salaries to people. And I recognize that, you know, one young lady, she she has two children. And so I do recognize those two children. She's there, you know, doing what she can to try to take care of her family. And so when you sit down and you look at it, and once you really sit down and look at the numbers, um, if you take the long approach, oh, my God, I'm, I'm going to be giving them 5000 more dollars over this two-year period. That sounds really big. But then when you sit down and you look at it, you know, each and every single day, what does that really mean? Then you're like, okay, you know, this is something that you need to sit down and do. Um, I think the average increase in paychecks have only been around 50 to 100 dollars in for instance in Seattle and that's not much for a family you know uh, of two or three you know and you still have yeah. to pay rent and you know you and, and the cost of living you know like we said so you know that that's not a lot of increase you it, know. you're exactly right but you know just look at it like this if that family is able to make do let's say on 13 dollars an hour now, all of a sudden, they get paid $15 an hour. If they're able to take those $2 an hour, and all of a sudden now that's going to allow them to be able to save and put a little something to the side, then that's huge. That's really big. And that helps them. But what it also does, it makes individuals become a more loyal employee. That's what I found out. So when I would sit down and start and, and, and give you that $15 an hour, I recognized the loyalty that the employee had to me because I didn't, wasn't forced by the law to do it, but it's just something that you feel like, you know, this is the right thing to do. And, um, you know, 2023 is a while, a while away, a ways a while. You know what I'm saying? A while away. <laughs> a while away. <laughs> and so you, when you sit down and look at it, to me, I think it's very, very, very important. You know, um, what do you say um, is going on out there, family? Go ahead and call in if you get a chance to sit down and touch bases to see how you feel about the $15 an hour wage increase. One of the things that will also be addressing this week down the General Assembly is reforming the Baltimore Police Department. Mayor Catherine Pugh seeks to bring a new police commissioner to the Baltimore House of Delegates. Uh, to Baltimore, that House of Delegates Judiciary Committee will be briefed on the status of the city's consent decree. The city of Baltimore U.S. Department of Justice agreed to sweeping reforms aimed at restoring community trust in officers and ensuring that they will work within the bounds of the United States Constitution. That's something they shouldn't have to ensure they're going to do. It's something they need to have been doing the whole time, period. The, the decree orders more supervision of officers and increased training on de-escalation tactics and interactions with youth, police uh, helping individuals with mental illness and protesters. It also creates a special citizen task force to find ways to enhance civilian oversight on the department, among other changes. So I guess what they're going to do is they're going to sit down. They're going to probably have the attorneys um, who are going to give an update about what's been going on in the consent decree. One of the things I do know is that this year they're going to start the training on a whole nother level. And I'm really excited about that. I think there are a lot of officers, there are a lot of young officers. The Baltimore City Department has lost a lot of officers, and now with the training, they'll be able to go out there and make the right decisions, do the right things, and they'll at least know what they're supposed to do. I've always been one to say, sometimes we're so quick as a society to say, oh, the officers should have done A, B, C, and D. But when you understand how the police officers are trained, then you recognize that, hey, they're doing what they're supposed to. They're doing it the right way. And these are the types of things that they were trained to do. I think it's important to have the citizen review panel because the citizen review panel then will understand also the way in which the officers are trained. And they'll sit down, I think, in many ways, be able to become a buffer to make sure that everybody knows that they're doing the right things the right way. I think, Jason, you said we have a caller. Yeah, yeah, we have a caller. And and family, if you get a chance, I would definitely recommend that you go to dmvdaily.news. Um, Hassan, again, has put out the second edition 
of the or second episode of the Annapolis report. And he talks about some of the uh, police reform bills that are looking at coming out. Uh, Senator Corey McRae is looking at um, doing uh, the police department restructuring as far as the uh, districts. The, the districts is concerned um, and basing it on the um, the census map mapping um, every 10 years, which I think that's great. Um, because then, then you can kind of rebuild your department based on exactly what your population is within your communities. Um, but uh, that's just one of the bills. And again, if you go to dmvdaily.news, check out the Annapolis report. Uh, Hassan has done some stellar reporting, um, and there's some interviews in there as well that you uh, should definitely listen to down in Annapolis. And he'll uh, definitely keep you abreast and attuned as to what's going on. Uh, with the Annapolis report. And also he'll be on uh, WOLB every Tuesday from uh, 7.15 to 7.30. Uh, this Wednesday, he'll also be sitting down with Larry Young on the Larry Young Morning Show on WOLB, I believe from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock or something like that. Uh, family, uh, make sure you check it out again. Hassan puts in a lot of work as far as the uh, Annapolis report is concerned. Um, and uh, he definitely brings a lot of information to the community. So uh, we have uh, Brother Michael uh, on the line. Brother Mike. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How y'all doing tonight? Hey, good, good. How you doing, brother? Uh, yeah, how you doing? I hope you will, good. man. Um, um, when you talk about the, um, the, the squeegee kids, let's go there first. It's not just about getting them jobs. It's about acquiring the right field of choice that's what already do within their heart. They already here on earth place to do something. And they don't know what, but they're just trying to keep it constructive and basically keep it by the law. So when it comes down to job placements, it needs to be something sound and structured that's basically like an assembly line. Before you can go put a, a package inside of an a 18 wheeler in a factory, you got to basically put it on an assembly line. It needs to foam. It needs to be wrapped. It needs to be basically processed. And it needs to be stamped on who it's going to, where it's going, and in those type of manners. The same with youth. We need to pick out their, we need to dig into them like dirt, find the diamond within them, and help them to shine in that area, just as you, as you state. It's a lot of kids that may feel like lawyers is, is where they really want to be. But 10 years of schooling versus, 10 years of schooling on the side of four years, they are, they're already afraid of the four years going in there already, in, yeah. into college, then let alone do another 10 to, uh, 7 to 10 years of, of law school. So it's kind of difficult to basically set them up in that structure when they're dealing with real life issues and basically which rolls back over to that $15, that $15 thing, $10, $9, $8. We only $8 away from slavery. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how hard it is for us to keep progressing and understanding that if we basically grow the economy, we make more room for a lot of other things to basically be furthered. And if we don't, we're just going to keep the same, we get the same results. We get people who don't want to go to work, who make another person's life hard because they at work, because at the end of the day, there's no freedom. There's no room for mistake or error, no room for trial and error when it comes down to the workforce. Then the kids that's outside of that seeing that, it's all a part of the process that's basically causing the society to act the way that they do and do what they do. It's not saying that anybody's wrong. It's just that nobody's really thinking forward or progressive to move forward. This is supposed to be the greatest country, but we $8 away from third world living. We $7 of, of a McDonald's meal to having $2 change for working a whole hour. That's, that's like, I, I don't even think that's even, that's even justified. It, yeah. it can't be. Because the, the infantries of, 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 of the military in the, in the early 1900s was making $3, and that was for the black, the black soldiers. So, like, so really we only, what, $5 away from being treated as black soldiers that wasn't even permissive in society? Yeah, yeah, brother, yeah. brother Mike, I actually read a report, I believe, this afternoon uh, that most of the federal workers, even though many of them are in middle class or considered to be and middle class status probably have less than a thousand dollars in savings and are wow. in the process of going through that savings now uh, because they didn't get wow. paid this Friday. You know, you know. wow. 
So I, I, I agree with Ivan, and you know, Jason, I, I definitely agree with you on what you were speaking on as well with the, with the fifteen dollars an hour. And once again, you know, I just wanted to give my input and basically, you know, be from a from a citizen standpoint to let them know, like, man, you know, that's that's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and it's just like you know, me on my end coming from a grassroots measurement. If I don't put in a budget, I don't get paid. If I don't put in the legwork, I don't get paid. Well, Congress can do all of those things and still get numerous of money. Like that's that's like it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's 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 totally unfair and it's injustice that's creating a lot of havoc that's going on within the realms of what we got going on in America. Yeah, that's true. That's really, really, really true. You know, I yeah, some really good points because it's not just giving them a job, but you have to give them a job that they feel connected to and give them a job that they want to do. And that's the thing. But a lot of times these kids don't know what jobs they want to do because they haven't had the exposure to yep. other jobs, yep. to other things. You know, I know when I tell the kids all the time, look, I almost I was one of those kids I almost flunked out of high school. But for a teacher who basically gave me a D, I would not have graduated. So I get that. I see that I understand that. And it wasn't that I wasn't smart, it was that I wasn't engaged in school. So I get it. I really get it. But then I did realize there was something that I wanted more and that's what drove me. You know, I joined the army and I joined the army. I was like, I don't want to dig ditches for anybody. And so you have to find the things that you want to do um, and, you know, things that just motivate you. And but it was being and having the opportunity to have someone give you something different that you didn't have. And, you know, I was blessed to have exactly the exposure, you know. And so that to me is why it's always important as a lawyer to let them see that there are black lawyers he, and what we look sure like. Indeed. He looks too dapper in a suit. I don't, I don't know how you look at some overalls and some boots. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> She's too dapper in a suit. You know, don't sleep. You know, when I was in high school, you know, our high school, we do, I learned my senior year, I was in the welding class. So don't trip on my arc, bo okay. boss. Because you got to look good to do what you do and exactly. do what you do. Exactly. <laughs> you know, that's true. We had the shipyard down there. So I thought I was going to work in the shipyard, man. My, my arc game was nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, y'all have a good one, man. Right, Thank y'all. Really Take All care. Brother, All right. All right. I've been the, 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 the man on the front lines fighting the fight for 15 and the bosses of all bosses, union bosses is on the line. Uh, Brother Mark, you there, sir? Good afternoon. Good evening. Hey, how are you? Hey, hey, what's up, brother? How are you doing today? I got you. What were we talking about? Was there someone talking mess about the 15 uh, minimum wage? No, no. Oh. So far, everybody look, look, look. has been very positive. <laughs> look, he, he coming on looking for me. That's what he, <laughs> looking for. he got no, that target no, on no, me. Jason, I, knew you were against. I was looking for against. You know, no, no. Crazy. Actually, I'm in favor of it. I'm that, that's what I said. Yeah. I didn't call to argue oh, with you. No, <laughs> no we I actually had against. positive people. I think. Yeah. More people are understanding the need. When you sit down and look at it, what are some of the things that when you go and you talk about the need and the fight for 15, what are some of the things that you talk about? Well, what needs to be clear is that to the extent that the fight for 15 is not implemented in Maryland, what it amounts to is a tax subsidy to big businesses that are paying their employees below $15 a week. $15 an hour in wages, and what that means is that they are eligible for a whole host of entitlement programs that the government is subsidizing. I mean, if you've got a single mother with three kids that's making $10 an hour, guess what? She's eligible for food stamps. She's eligible for housing. She's eligible yeah. for child care subsidies. These are all things that the government is subsidizing on the behalf of a Walmart that won't do the right thing. Yeah, I was just going to say that, Mark. It, it was it's crazy and absurd because Walmart was one of the most guilty corporations oh, as far as this was concerned because they actually had workers that would come in and teach yeah. their workers how to fill out yeah. for food stamps. 
and and, and yeah. Others, yeah, not, yeah, they would teach them That's that. The point I'm making: there are people that are spending <laughs> billions of dollars in Walmart a year, and what happens is their workers are applying for public subsidies that are eating up the public taxpayer dollars. So when you pay for cheap stuff at Walmart, you're also paying for their employees to access food stamps and other social safety net programs. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand that. You know, so when people say, oh, no, we can't raise the minimum wage because that would result in disaster for small businesses. It's just not true. Small businesses are not who's paying less than $15 an hour. The other thing that's important to understand is that $15 an hour is not tomorrow. It's yes. in three and for four years, depending on the bill. If you have a business model that depends on paying your employees poverty wages in perpetuity, you should shut down your business and try something else. <laughs> true. That's very true. <laughs> Let me ask you this: You're, you are, you have your boots on the ground, so to speak. How do you feel mm -hmm. the re, uh, the feeling reaction has been from some of those in the legislature and Senate? I feel really good this year about the legislature. I mean, the changes that we've made in the legislature, both in the House and the Senate, I think are good, are very positive. I think those are, you know, the new people that we've elected have a real hunger to do the right thing for working families, not just in Baltimore City, because. My challenge is that many people think that this is about folks in Baltimore City, but a state bill is about folks across the state. And quite frankly, Montgomery County is already headed that way. We're talking about across the state folks that not $15 an hour tomorrow, although it should be. If you take Roosevelt's minimum wage and you index it to inflation, minimum wage should be about 21 or $22 an hour by now. We're just Amen. asking to get to 15 in the next three years. And if you have a business model that doesn't allow for that, maybe you should open another business. That's not the one for you. Yeah. Because you wouldn't pay yourself less than that. So don't pay your employees less than that. I think on the Annapolis report, Hassan actually speaks to one of the delegates that actually says that $15 an hour to him is not a livable wage. And he's actually looking for a higher increase, uh, Mark. But uh, l let me ask you. Do you think that the House and the Senate has the super majority needed to override a, gov a governmental, I mean, a governor's veto? Because we know that uh, the, Governor Hogan is not necessarily in favor of this $15 minimum uh, increase. Surprise, surprise. Governor Hogan was reelected on the backs of people that are already making $15 an hour. So none of them, most of them, are not concerned about the struggles of people across this state that are struggling to, to feed their kids. You know, what he doesn't realize is that, and this is important, if you get people that are at the margins socioeconomically, if you give them a raise, they don't invest it in a 401k or a 403b yeah. or a retirement program. They're going to spend every last dollar that they're making over and above that at local grocery stores, at local... Yeah you know, restaurants and local movie theaters, and lo and behold, maybe they'll take their kids to Ocean City one summer. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it can change the lives of people that are making 9 or $10 an hour. But the difference is what they will be making, they spend right away. So you're stimulating the economy even as you're raising the minimum wage. And that's important to understand, and that's something that, you know, Business owners claim that they don't understand, but intuitively they do. You know, it's, it's funny you say that because if I'm not mistaken, Ronald Reagan, didn't he talk about this trickle down economy that he talked about? Yeah. And there's so many people from the Republican side that love Ronald Reagan that talk about, oh, he was a great, he understood the economy. And if you think about really what you're talking about is the trickle down economy. You're going to pay your workers to $15 an hour. The workers are going to spend the money and it's going to trickle down back into the businesses. So back into your profits. So you won't feel well, the pain. Well, actually respectfully, what Ronald Reagan was proposing is a trick trickle down economy is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. Okay. When Ronald Reagan said a trickle down economy, what he said was cut rich people's taxes to zero and they will <laughs> to respond the out of the goodness of their heart. Right, to the rich. By oh. paying their workers more. Right. Well, and see. It did not 
materialize. It didn't turn out to be. And so now a $15 minimum wage, to the extent that it means anything, it's a trickle-up economy. Pay poor people more, and they'll patronize stores more, and that, and that will enrich the store owners. And the you know what I call the landed gentry of the city. Yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. The, the current administration, uh, Donald Trump, is, is his mm -hmm. new tax restructuring is kind of almost yes. the same policy as Ronald Reagan. Yes. Oh, trickle yeah. down. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And it was, we need trickle up. And so the funny thing is, when you say the trickle down, you instantly think like, okay, you're going to charge the people. The people spend the money, and it come. You know, you'll pay the people, and it goes downward. But you know, right. it's the exact opposite. You know, yeah. Um, and and rain, it, you rain, know. Your, rain your tax rates with blessings on those who need it the least, and somehow miraculously, I have a Christian sense of duty. They're going to rain it down on people who need it the most. I think yeah. we've seen so far that that doesn't work. No, I agree. Doesn't come close to working. We, we do have uh, one caller, Mark. Mark, I'm going to hold you on, and I'm going to bring the caller in. Um, Thank you, Jason. Right. Caller, are you there? Hello? Yes, uh, you're on the air with the DMV Daily Radio Show. Yeah, how you doing? Um, my name is Keith Scott, and I've been listening to the, um, the whole conversation about, um, you know, about minimum wage. And, okay, but <clears throat> when you raise the minimum wage, everything else is going up with it. Okay, the whole thing is like, if you're going to, if you're going to raise, I mean, if you're not going to, bring jobs to to people to actually work and get off of public affairs and get off of being dependent on the government, you're still going to have the same situation you have today. In Baltimore City, you have a lot of work, but, you know, less skilled workers and stuff. you got uh, constructions that, uh, that can last another 30 years, but we're not, we're not trying to create these jobs for people. We're trying to raise the minimum wage and when the minimum wage go up, whole lot people gonna lose their jobs, and the prices of the goods are gonna go up. So it's pretty much to feed the whole purpose. Keep, keep. That's a misconception. So again, no. I just they did a study in both Seattle and in San Francisco, which are already hitting yep. at fifteen dollars an hour. And the worst thing that happened was the less skilled workers did have issues as far as finding employment was concerned because the if you had to pay fifteen dollars an hour most of these employers felt that they wanted the more seasoned more experienced workers and that could easily be resolved as well on the lower level in our communities by having job readiness programs by encouraging the unions to 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 uh, fund and create apprenticeship programs so there's even things that you can do on the lower level that can get some of these lower skilled employees that may not be necessarily be as enticing as those that are seasoned and a little bit more experienced. There's even ways that we can work within our uh, com community colleges, uh, apprenticeship programs, soft skill development programs that we can actually work with a lot of these lower level uh, employees and get them up to right. the, the point where they would be ready to be able to go to an employer that is looking for somebody a little bit more seasoned and a little bit more experienced because they do have right. to pay a well, higher J wage. Jason, Jason, mm -hmm. this is the same logical canard that argues that if you increase wages for workers, you're going to have more electronic stations where people order food or order services through a computer or through some kind of mechanism that's set up in some McDonald's and some uh, Royal Farms and Kiosk. some other places. And Walmart. Yeah. Right, and Walmart. This mm -hmm. is the problem. Without a nickel's increase in the minimum wage, that's happening anyway. So if the argument Correct. is that we have to stop automation of customer service by lowering people's wages, then why don't we just abolish the minimum wage period and let people work for a dollar an hour or two dollars an hour or a bus fare? Or a chicken box. You know, <laughs> you can take this to a ridiculous. Yeah, but extreme. that's not. But, but but the whole point is, long as long as the unemployment rate is going to be so high, you're going to have all the necessary things that comes with, it, like high crime and the murder rate. Okay, right. It's no matter if if you're going to actually raise people, uh, raise the minimum wage, but you're still going to have the high crime and the high murder rate. All you got this. I mean, if other than bringing jobs to people who need these kind of services, you still gonna, it's still going to defeat the purpose. Okay, you got a person that's making more money, but he can't walk the street because you're going to get shot going to work. I mean, I mean what are we, we trying so, to do so here? How does, 
how does keeping a low minimum wage help with crime prevention? Oh, no. Well, I didn't, no, I didn't know. One, I did not say the fact that it's, I mean, the whole point is that's not, that's not the problem to the solution. The solution is job. Don't raise it because we have crime. No, you can raise it. I mean, when I, I, I started a job, my, my oh. minimum wage was $5 an hour, $4.50, $4.75 an hour. Yeah, okay, I remember it that only days, went up, what? Days since, myself. Since I was working for 30, <laughs> 40 Have years. It only went up a couple of dollars. Are you now in favor of raising the minimum wage? Have we got a contract? Of, of, of course. Um, I raise the minimum wage, oh, but it's gonna, the it's the cost, the consequences are going to come in. you got to save the consequences. As I said, you, you um, look at McDonald's. McDonald's is, is laying off half of their people because of the computers. There's raw farms and Walmart. And guess what? They're doing it now when they're right, right, the right. And wage. we're just so talking about a ten, ten. <laughs> we're just talking about a ten, ten an not, hour but, minimum wage statewide. Yeah, but the point is, like I said, that's not gonna be. That's not the problem to the. Uh, that's not. That's not a solution to the problem. The problem because there's no jobs. Yeah, and, and I think it's. I mean, I mean you. Keep, the keep, problem is no jobs. Keep keeping. That's it, the problem. Right, minimum wage is not problem. You're not lowering the amount of jobs by. Tightening the minimum wage. The minimum wage. Well, you is hold on. People lose a lot put, of jobs. Of course, you put, <laughs> lose a lot of jobs. If you put, if you put more dollars in the amount of people, if you take an eleven dollar an hour worker and give her fifteen dollars an hour, guess where she spends that money? It's not with T. In price. the store. Okay. <clears throat> right. Right. It right. Exactly. It's, it's, the, of course, but the whole point. But the whole point, like I said, if who's going to pay fifteen dollars for uh for a Big Mac meal? Right. But, but here's the thing, Keith. In some cases, we're, we're talking about apples and oranges because we're talking about trends with millennials and Generation Xers that technically they, they don't want the customer service level. They want to get in, scan their item on their own in most cases, and leave out of a business. That's a trend that's but, happening but nation, nationwide and has oh, nothing well, to do with well, the are, business I mean, in itself. Labor I'm saying something. Today, right. They're old for <laughs> I'm a day. I do not want to talk to a machine. Correct. I want someone to I'm check paying. me out. I'm one of them. Whether me it's too. in a grocery I'm one store of them. or right. in CVS or in anywhere else. So there's always going to be a need. But to argue that we can't raise the minimum wage because everyone's going to be a machine customer service, they're doing that now and we haven't raised Correct. the minimum wage. Correct. And again, they a lot of that prepare, has to do with trends. It. They prepare it for that, though. They, right. That's, prepare, they prepare that's for not that necessarily that preparing. I'm telling you, a lot of that has to do with trends with millennials and Generation Xers. It's just like I tried to explain the other day to someone, I do Uber Eats. And you'd be surprised that somebody just wants to order a frappe or an order of fries and is willing to pay 5 or $6 in a service fee to have, yeah, Ivan's looking wow. at me shocked, but there's oh, people that order just a frappe or an order of fries because that's what they want. And because we live in this wow. instantaneous, on-demand society, where these Generation Xers and these Millennials can click a button and have service or have something done inst instantly, you know, th that's the trends that you see with within the consumer market. That has nothing to do with necessarily labor and wages, and again, has everything to do with what the Millennials want as far as what they want to see as far as customer service is concerned. I'll give you one more example. Ooh. Amazon is actually creating these little stores where you can go in, scan your items Ooh. on your phone, and don't even have to interact with any customer service at all. Right. Bag your own items, scan oh, yeah. your items, and walk <laughs> out of the, the, the uh, 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 grocery store with your items already paid for. And that's what millennials right, and Generation Xers want. The, wow. You know? You're right, Jason, but that's the other problem with the race to the bottom. If you talk, talk, about, talk about Amazon, Amazon makes billions of dollars, but they don't want to pay the folks in their factory that are actually shipping the things that you bought online yeah. for cheap, $15 an hour. Yeah, I think their starting wage is $12 an hour. People are dropping dead in Amazon factories. I mean, you can Google it. Yeah. There are employees that have heart conditions that are too scared to ask for an hour off to see a cardiologist because they fear they're going to lose their job. Wow. This is the problem. When you give unfettered access to business, it's called laissez-faire. Google it, Adam Smith laissez-faire. When you let business do exactly what they want to do, they do not look out for their workers. They look out for the profit margins of the landed gentry and the owners. You know, this is the problem. This yeah. is why government stepped in. This is why there is a minimum wage. 
Because if there was not a minimum wage in the time of Roosevelt, he would have had folks, the, 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 the Rockefellers of the world, would have had their workers working for a dollar an hour and said, if you don't like it, I'll get somebody else more desperate to work for me. Yeah. That's yeah. not yeah. the way this country is supposed to work. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter if you minimum wage go up, it, it can go up. But just, when minimum wage go up, prices things prices go up too. So it pretty much defeating the whole purpose of the minimum wage going up. Why would prices go up if the minimum wage? Because they always do. Because they always no. Do. That's not true. Yeah, and that's not the again. I would Seattle. I would refer you to Seattle. Correct. No, Correct. And, and New York is getting ready to follow right behind it. And New York has had high prices. People already pay five dollars for a Big Mac way before the fifteen dollar an hour came up because yeah. of the price of real no, estate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. There you yep. go. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's going to do that. I mean, you're going to have you got to have people losing their job because they're going to go automate or, or you know, the machines and but, stuff. But that hasn't been the case in Seattle. They haven't lost their jobs. Again, the only real. Uh, residual well, effect yeah, of fifteen dollars. You talking about, uh, talking about uh, Seattle, Washington? Yeah, Seattle. The only residual you can go look it up. They actually had a university that actually did a study to 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 find out what the impact of fifteen dollars an hour has been over the last six to twelve months. And again, the only uh, residual Seattle, effect, the only res residual well, effect that they found uh, was got a, Seattle got its own problems right now. You know, like the high suicide rate. But the whole point, I'm like. Mm -hmm. I mean, do a survey like that in New York or Baltimore. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think we'll do like just fine. Like unskilled labor. I mean, you got. I mean, you got. The, you got a whole city that that's aching for a renew. Keith, Keith, let me ask you something. Do you feel that a nurse that takes care of your family or takes yeah, care of my she family deserve, she deserves what she can get. She deserves what she's got. But, she, she but deserves, do you realize that John Hopkins? Get. We just saw just recently at the Baltimore City. Maryland delegation of the uh, uh, Maryland General Assembly, we actually had uh, health care workers that were testifying to the fact that they make $13 an hour at John Hopkins. Here's an institution that pays zero taxes and gets all kinds of government and subsidies you know, from the city and state, and they pay their health care workers, their I'm nurses, $13 okay. an hour. Hey, Jason, Jason, I'm, Jason, I'm glad you brought, uh, Jason, I'm glad you brought this up because I'm the political director for SEIU, and my sister union represents the, the, the workers. When we had the big rally at City Hall with Danny Glover and everyone else, you know why? That was because there were women that were dietary technicians or, or sanitary technicians that clean up the ER after you throw up that had been working at Johns Hopkins, the most endowed hospital in the entire nation, yeah. that were making 12 and $13 an hour after 30 years of service. Wow. Unconscionable. <laughs> wow. Unconscionable. Wow. Hey, like, I, but I, I just, wow. I, I'm, it, like I said, a minimum wage is needed, but it's not going to be some, it's not, it's not going to be the thing that, that actually the solution of why problems. No, it's not. There happening. should be a floor. That's all we're arguing. Yep. I'm not saying that 15 should be the maximum. There ought to be a floor, though, in if after three or four or five years as a business, you can't afford to pay your employees $15 an hour so that they can live a life of dignity, you should sell that business and start another one. And, and, that's that's true. True. and you have the Saudi king and the Saudi prince visiting John Hopkins Hospital, so I don't think they have any issues, and Bloomberg donating oh, billions yeah. of dollars to John Hopkins, and, and again, them getting all that's kinds of subsidies. I don't John think they have Hopkins, any issues paying $15 with all their an hour. Well, will not do the right thing by their workers. No one else will either without government's helping hands. Yeah. Well, that's right. Well, look, well, look, family. Well, I got a question. I got, can I ask you one question? Well, we we we, we, we well, gotta go. We gotta go. Unfortunately, no. One question. Man. Why is John Hopkins a nonprofit organization? I'm oh, not sure. I don't know. No, about John that. Hopkins is not a, a, a nonprofit organization. Yes, it is. No. Yes, it, yes, they are. Are they, they a for profit? Mark? Listen, listen. Right. I know about. You're not gonna tell me any. They're not a five. No, C three. They're a, it's a five hundred one C three. Hmm. No. Okay. I, no. Yes. Well, look, yes. look, look, look I, fam, I, I have phone. got to go. We, I we, know what. I, okay. We, we gotta go. Check it out. We gotta it's a go. We, we got to go. We'll check it out. Make sure you call all back right. and enjoy your Don conversation. All right, my brother. It's a C three, but the institution is not a C three. I promise you. All right, we'll, 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 we'll have to look at that and, and come back on that on another day. But all right. fa family, I want to let y'all know before we go, 
if you do have any questions or comments about any of the shows that you've heard, including this show today, you can always call into the DMV Daily call-in line, the 410-819-2370, and you can actually leave your question or comment on the voicemail system. Now, any comment that you leave on the system, uh, do be aware that it may be used in a future broadcast on the DMV Daily Radio Show. So you always have an opportunity, even after we go off air, to be able to chime in on any of this, 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 this discussions that we have had here on the program. Hey, so, I just want to thank everybody. This was uh, Jason and I were rolling solo. Our, our dog, Mark, came on in. And, and handled what he needed to handle, and so it was a great, Thanks great for inviting program. Me on, Ivan. <laughs> oh, no, nah, no, nah, you part of the team. So, um, you know, tomorrow I think we have a very, very good show. We have a number of individuals yeah. um, that are running. They're the running. Of the Baltimore City Democratic Party. That, I'm not going to be involved because I got to vote on Wednesday, but I'll be listening. Yes, yes, yes. So we're very excited about that. So, family, make sure you tune in. I want to say thank you so much. Everybody be safe. Mark, really quick, who are the candidates? Can you uh, just say who the four candidates are really quickly for the family? Or did we lose Mark? I think we lost Mark. Yeah, lost Mark. I think I may know. Um, well, the, the four candidates, I believe, who will be coming will be uh, Monica. Let me see, Monica Cooper. Jasmine Collins, Caritha Barber, and Alex Garcia. Okay. I believe Caritha, Monica, and Jasmine will be here, and I don't think that Mr. Garcia will be able to make it. However, let's sit down and listen to everybody. And on that note, thank you so much, people. Stay safe, stay warm, stay dry, and free Keith Davis. <laughs> free Keith Davis. <laughs>